Physics Notes, Unit 4.2, Newton's Second Law. And in this section, it answers one of the biggest questions in this semester, or this unit, or this term of physics, and that is, what causes acceleration? I'll probably keep asking that question. And the answer is net force. Net force is what causes acceleration. Let me circle that. Net force. Not force. Net force. What do we mean by net force? Well, for example, I'm sitting in a chair right now. Are there forces acting on me? The answer is yes. There are actually two forces acting on me as I sit in a chair. And they are gravity pulling me down and then the support of the chair up. But the, the, the downward force of gravity on me in Newtons is like six, just over 600 Newtons down in pounds. It's like 130 pounds, 135 pounds of force straight down. But here's the thing. The chair is pushing up with the same force. And these are vectors. They're directional. So gravity is trying to pull me down with a force, 600 Newtons. But my chair is pushing up with 600 Newtons. So what is the net force on me right now? Zero. There is no net force. There are forces acting on me. No net force. This net force thing is very, very important. That's when you have an excess of a force. When one force beats another force. Or you could have five or six forces, and you got to kind of look at them all as a combination. you got to do the vector addition like we did a couple of units ago to see if there's uh, a leftover force that's not zero. So this also is an offshoot of the first law that talks about, you know, well, there's object at rest, stay at rest, object in motion, stay in motion with constant velocity unless acted on by an unbalanced or a net force. So sometimes this is called an unbalanced or an outside force, but the best case, and almost all, I think all physics teachers will stress, this is net force. And then there's always a subscript. Sometimes we get sloppy. I'll put the box around it. And we leave off that subscript net, but we should never leave that off of this equation. It's net force that causes acceleration, not force. And... The other kind of little review thing here is there's really only two types of motion we're studying in this term. And we've already done that in units two and three. And that is either we have constant velocity where there's no acceleration. That's really Newton's first law. There's no net force. Or we have acceleration. And the cases where we have acceleration, there's a net force. The net force and the acceleration are always in the same direction. Where there's acceleration, there's net force. Where there's net force, there's acceleration. If there's no net force, there's no acceleration. There's what you say, either either the at rest or there's constant velocity. Because those are the two cases to be not accelerating. If you're just at rest, obviously you're not accelerating. If you're at constant velocity, though, okay, you are not accelerating. Either one of those, there's zero net force. Anyway, then, we've basically had these concepts already. We've had force. In this case, we have net force. But the standard units are Newtons, capital N. Put that over here on the right, capital N. Standard units for mass are kilograms. So always convert to kilograms. And for acceleration, it's meters per second squared. So we usually put meters per second squared like this. But sometimes I'll put the meters per second per second, same thing. Now, actually one of the bigger um, uh, things to study here as we prepare to apply Newton's second law uh, are what are called free body force diagrams. I'm going to spend more time on this, probably, I should say force, than the application. But I'll, we'll apply this law as well. Because the, the application, if you draw good diagrams, the application is pretty easy. Uh, so we need to practice the diagrams. Now I've summarized the rules for drawing these diagrams. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples here. So uh, these are kind of the way I approach these and most teachers approach it in some sort of fashion like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can draw a diagram, but you can draw a diagram of one object, free of all other objects. I'll give you a bunch of examples here. Like the first example is going to be a book sitting on a table. Well, we're really um, interested in the book, not the table. So we're only going to draw the book, not the table. If you start drawing two objects in the diagram, you confuse things. We'll do that in a minute. Um, keep the... Uh, the uh, um, the diagram's as simple as possible. That's actually under number three here. Let me just go to number two. So we're going to draw vector force arrows. 
in their vectors. So the direction is going to be very important. And how big you draw them, we're going to try to draw them to the correct size. We'll see that in a minute. So number three then is we're going to keep our diagrams as simple as possible. A lot of times I'll just draw a dot or a circle or a box for my object. If it's a car, you don't, you don't need to draw a car, just draw a box. If it's a person, you could just draw a dot or a, it's a, or a box, a square. The actual object doesn't really matter that much. Keep it as simple as possible. But with simple objects, I usually draw like a ball. I draw a round thing for a ball. For a person, sometimes I draw a stick person. But if you have to draw an airplane or a helicopter or an elephant or something like that, some people like drawing fancy diagrams, but sometimes that's a distraction as well because it, it's, it's not the quality of the actual picture of the item that's important. It's the most important thing about the diagram is your are your arrows, your vector arrows, and how you um, direct them, as I'll show you. Part 3C here, I'll put a tail on the arrow at the center of mass of the object. I'll practice that. And uh, that's not a hard and fast rule, especially when we get to torque problems. We have to make an adjustment. That's going to be later in the semester or in, in the term. And uh, But I'll, I'll try to do it this way, but you don't have to do it that way. The most important thing is having your arrows pointing in the right direction. Now, forces basically come in two variations, so to speak. There are invisible forces that you're going to still draw with an arrow, and gravity is like an invisible thing. And what I mean by that is, um, and I probably could have called it a, a non-contact force. I've already mentioned that, I think, in the previous notes. Um, so, for example, I don't need to be touching the Earth to realize that gravity pulls down on me. If I jump up in the air, gravity still pulls down on me. It's an invisible force. It's, I don't have to be contact. I don't have to be touching the Earth for it to be active. All right. As opposed to double I down here, visible forces. Okay. When two things are touching each other, they're exerting a force on each other. If, I, if I'm throwing a baseball, I'm exerting a force on the baseball while I'm touching the baseball. If a book is sitting on a table, the book is exerting a force on a table, and the table is exerting a force on the book, which is what we're more interested in here, as I will draw for you. So here, let me, let me practice these. Uh, they're really more than guidelines. These are good uh, rules, so to speak, and sometimes we uh, bend them a little bit, but not much. For example here, number one. So I have a book sitting at rest on a table. I want to draw the free body force diagram. As I mentioned before, I really do, I'm, I don't care about the table. The, the main object here is the book. What We could draw a free body force diagram for the table as well. But right now, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to focus on the book. So I have a book from a side view. It looks like a rectangle. I could label that the book, but I won't. A lot of times, what I'll do is I'll put a dot in the center, like the center of mass. I'm not sure why it's doing this right now. All right. So I have the center of mass of the book. All right. So a book sits on a table. Well, this is going to be in like 99.9% .9 of your diagrams. Well, on any diagram that takes place or a situation that takes place on Earth, you're always going to have a down arrow, which is the force of gravity. The only time you don't have that is when you're in outer, outer space. But if you're on, even on a different planet, you're going to have the downward force of gravity. It's always downward. So uh, I sometimes would take a shortcut. But for the, for the most part, I always put F sub G F sub gravity, I spell it out. Sometimes I just put F sub G. Force of gravity. Force of gravity straight down. So I like to put subscripts on all my forces. I label them. Sometimes, like I say, we take a shortcut on this. Force of gravity is sometimes, well, a lot of times it's called the weight. Little w. We calculated that in the previous notes. We'll be doing those calculations here in a little bit. So as, as a book sits on a table, um, gravity is pulling on all parts of the book. But it's pulling down. The main thing is gravity pulls down. So... Um, I just, we just kind of generalize and say gravity pulls down on the center of the book. It's pulling down on all parts, but just apply that force straight down. We do that every time. Also then, if the book is sitting on a table, the table's holding it up all over on, on, under the book. Well, once again, the easiest thing to do is consolidate that entire force. The table pushes up or pull up. Yeah, pushes up. I'm going to call that force of table. Later on, you're going to, we're going to, we're going to give that a generic name called the normal force where the word normal means perpendicular, perpendicular to a surface. Now, if I've done this perfectly here, those two arrows should be the same length because if gravity pulls down with two newtons of force, the table's pushing up with two newtons of force, the net force, if we were to do a calculation here, and this book would be zero. It's sitting at rest on a table, so the net first has, force has to be zero. So this also goes back to Newton's first law. The object's at rest, it stays at rest. There's no net force to cause any acceleration. All right, so now number two. 
a book being pushed at constant velocity with friction uh, on the table. So once again, it's the same book, and I'm pushing it across the table. And there's a table. There's also somebody pushing, like my hand is pushing on the, on the book. But I don't want to draw the table. I don't want to draw the hand or whatever's pushing this book. It doesn't really matter. But this same book has those same two forces as before. It has the force of gravity. And it has the table pushing up. And once again, these two, four, uh, as best you can, I'm not, you're not, you don't have to measure them out exactly, but that's the force of the table. Try to make them about the same length. And once again, try to label these. Well, I require that you label them on the test, on the homework. Label these forces. Now, once again, those two are equal to each other. In the first case, I said two newtons, two newtons. Net force there is zero. But now you're pushing, and it doesn't say which, doesn't say which way you're pushing this book. Let's just say we're pushing it to the right. All right? The book is moving to the right. really wouldn't matter. But if it's moving to the right, that means I'm pushing. Let's call it the force of push. Now, the force of push might be bigger than gravity, less than gravity. I, I don't know, but I just drew a kind of a sort of a random link there. Force of push. So I'm pushing the book to the right with my hand. I don't want to draw the hand. All right? But that represents somebody, something, pushing the book to the right. Now... We really haven't talked about friction a whole lot yet, and it really is going to come up in the next page of notes more specifically. But uh, one generalization, I think you can you can get this pretty easily, is that friction always works against you. It works against the motion. So if I'm pushing to the right, friction works against me because the book is rubbing on a table. We're all familiar with friction. It wants to slow the book down. It's trying to stop the book. I'm trying to make, or whoever's trying to push the book is trying to make it go to the right, trying to make it accelerate to the right even. But... The book is not accelerating to the right, it's moving at constant velocity because friction works against us. So in specific here, but in general, friction works against you. This is the force of friction. And that would be, if I drew these exactly proportional, it would be the same size as your push. Let's say I'm pushing with three newtons of force, trying to make the book speed up, trying to make it accelerate. Well, if friction's working against me with three newtons of force, all right? The book is going to just keep moving at that speed, all right? Uh, kind of one disclaimer, we'll come back to this once again with friction, more specific friction examples. But it would take, you need to have a force bigger than friction to get the book going. But once you have a book sliding, once you have something sliding, all you have to do is match the friction because if you beat friction, you speed it up. If friction beats you, in other words, it's a bigger force than your push, then the book slows down. But if you are pushing something and equaling the frictional force that's working against the motion, then it will stay at that constant velocity. If I let go of the push right that now, that frictional force would be the net force that would slow this book down. Or if I pushed harder and made my force bigger than friction, it would speed up. Then I would have a net force to the right. We'll do some examples in a couple minutes here. All right, so a ball falling straight down. So you have a ball in the air, no air resistance. So we're gonna start out, that's free fall. So with balls, I usually just draw a circle. Sometimes I draw like this, like it's a, like those are the seams of a baseball. You don't need to do that. You could even just make these dots. All of these, even the ones I just did with the book, you could just make those dots on a piece of paper. You don't even need to draw the rectangle if you want to keep it simple. So a ball is falling in the air, all right? So like all of these, okay, there is a force straight down. I don't know how much this ball weighs. It doesn't really matter. I don't have any numbers yet, but on... Like I say, if you're on Earth, you always have you can always start your diagrams with that arrow. Don't get that one wrong. Just it's, it's always force of gravity pulling straight down. So I'm just going to label it force of gravity. Now, if a ball is falling in the air straight down, and there's no air resistance, nothing else is touching the ball. That's the only force. That is the net force. So uh, sometimes you have multiple forces that you got to com combine to get the net force, as you will see. Uh, when there's only one force, that is the net force. This ball here will accelerate because it has, uh, that force of gravity will not be zero. So it will accelerate down. In fact, it will accelerate down if there's no air resistance at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared, no matter what its mass is. That's one of the rules of free fall. Uh, if there's no air resistance, all things will fall at that rate. All right, now, somebody throws a ball horizontally. Now, here's a couple things that we have to kind of focus on when we do these problems. When, when it, the problem says you've thrown a ball horizontally, that means you've released the ball. It's no longer in your hand. It's a different scenario if the ball is still in a person's hand, but it's implied here 
the ball was thrown horizontally, not during the process of throwing. If you're during the process of throwing, you have to apply another force because your hand is exerting like a forward force on the ball. But if I throw a ball horizontally and let go, so that's what I'm talking about. Uh, so this would be after after the release. That's, that's implied here, after the release. After the release of the ball. The ball is moving sideways and actually will curve to the ground, but that doesn't matter quite yet, like a projectile, uh, which we already studied. We're not really studying, though, um, the two components right now. We're looking at this free body diagram, so, but we will put this all together eventually with projectile motion. But after you release a ball, right now we're looking at forces, not what the velocity is, not what the displacement is. Not even calculating the acceleration right now. We're just looking at the free body force diagram. What is what are the forces acting on the ball? Well, once again, like the other four, uh, other three, okay, this ball has a force of gravity straight down. Force of gravity straight down. And that's it. After you release it, if there's no air resistance, it's like number three. And that doesn't maybe feel quite right. It feels like there should be another force. Well, if there's air resistance, which there's not, it says there's no air resistance, if the ball were moving to the right, then air resistance would be to the left. If the ball were moving to the left, the air resistance would be to the right. But we don't know, um, well, no, we do know there's no air resistance. So you don't draw any air resistance vector. This is the net force that will cause the ball to fall to the ground. It will accelerate down at 9.8, just like in the vector and the projectile problems. That's why the ball, once you roll a ball off a table or project it sideways uh, or drop it, but project it sideways in, in uh, particular here for a projectile, it will start falling and accelerating at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared because of the force of gravity. Now, one other thing, I'm not going to draw this on here because it's not labeled, but if I had to draw a ball that's being thrown, in the process of being thrown, so the ball is in somebody's hand and they're throwing it to the right, while the ball is in the hand, this would be the beginning of the diagram. You'd have the force of gravity straight down, but then you'd also have a force to the right. We call that the force of the hand. So I would have, if I'm throwing a ball straight sideways, I wouldn't draw the hand. I would just draw the same diagram, and then I would have a force of the hand to the right in addition to the force of gravity. Uh, that's a little complicated. I don't want to get into that right now because actually if it's in your hand as well, you're actually holding it up. So it doesn't fall down. So actually, in a sense, your hand doesn't have two forces, but it's two components of force. It's actually, if you're throwing it to the right, you're, you're applying a force to the right and you're holding it up. So you have the rightward and the upward components. So together you have a, a force that's, uh, you'd have to Pythagorize it like we did with, uh, with the vector uh, components and so forth to get the net force uh, that you're, because you're accelerating the ball with that force. But we're not gonna do those complicated situations quite yet. Just want to keep it simple as we go here. So here's uh, some interesting ones. A person's in an elevator accelerating up. Once again, you can draw the person here. You can draw a person. I'm not going to draw a person. I'm just going to draw a box, a square. That's the person. All right. Keep it simple. You could draw a dot. All right. I'm going to look at the dot in the center. So, uh, so that's this is the person. And if you look back in your notes, okay, um, you might want to say, okay, that's the person. That You might want to label it in your notes. I don't want to label it here because I want to keep this as simple as possible. But that's the person. But the dot represents the middle of the person. The dot is the middle of the person. We do not want to draw the elevator. Okay, so that's not the elevator. That box there is not the elevator. So you better be, hopefully you have your sound on right now because if you don't have your sound on, you might think that box is the elevator. This is the person in the elevator. All right? Maybe I will draw the person in this case, just to kind of emphasize that. Um, but usually I would just draw a box. Okay, so here's the here's the person. All right. So let me. I'm going to use different colors now. All right. So you have the middle of the person. So I'm going to make a this blue dot be the middle of the person. Okay. So the person's standing in the elevator, just like the other four. There's a force of gravity straight down. Force of gravity. So the force of gravity is pulling straight down on that person. All right, that's 
every diagram. Are there other forces acting on this person? Well, the person's standing on the floor of the elevator, so technically that is the other force acting on them. You're not hanging onto the wall, you're standing on the floor. And what does the floor do for you? Well, it pushes up on you, just like sitting in a chair pushes up on you. So there's gonna be, now, the thing here is it says this person is accelerating upward in this elevator. That means that this upward force, and I'm gonna purposely draw it longer, the force of the floor is bigger than the force of gravity. So hopefully you see that I've drawn it a little bit bigger. Force of the floor of the elevator is pushing up on you, and that force is bigger. So there's a net force up, that's why you're accelerating up. And when you're in an elevator in that situation, you kind of feel heavy. Your weight doesn't change, but you feel heavier. If you were standing on a bathroom scale there, your bathroom scale would kind of give you a reading that's higher than what your normal weight is. So that's the force of the floor. Once again, sometimes we call that the normal force. That's the floor, the force perpendicular to the floor, or perpendicular to the surface you're standing on. So, but I like to just label it specifically, that's the floor pushing up on you. Now, what if the person's in the elevator and accelerating down? Okay, let me go back to red. So I'll, I'll draw the person again. All right. So if you're in the elevator, now it's accelerating down. How is that going to look any different than number five? So I draw a dot here. All right. Well, the force of gravity is still down, still whatever that force is. If you're 600 newtons, it is force of gravity. Uh, you're accelerating down. But as you accelerate down, what are the forces acting? Well, still, you're still standing on the floor. You're not floating off the floor. But what happens here in this case is for the accelerator, the, the, the elevator to accelerate down, the force of the floor is now less than it was before because now the force of gravity is bigger than the force of the floor. So I purposely drew that little arrow. It should be straight up on that dot, straight up on that dot. Uh, as the, so like you're at the top floor of a, of a building and you get in the elevator and when you when the door closes and it starts going down, like it accelerates down, it kind of has to get up to a certain speed. During that short period of time, one, two, three, whatever, how many seconds it takes, you're going to feel a little bit lighter first. If you kind of feel, ooh, it feels like you lift off the, you don't lift off the floor. Now, if the elevator has a large acceleration, or if you're at a ride in an amusement park like the, like the giant drop at Great America, you really feel like that that force goes really small, and you feel like you're lifting off the floor. In fact, some, you you could. If it's total free fall where they cut the cable or you are in like the, the, the ride at Great America where it pretty much just drops you uh, without any support, that force of the floor basically goes to zero and you are accelerating at 9.8. So it feels really weird. You feel really light. You're in free fall basically. But in, in an elevator, they don't accelerate you that quickly. But the, there's a net force down there. That's why you accelerate down. All right, a bear. Say there's a bear. Uh, sliding down a smooth tree. I don't care about the tree. I care about the bear. This time I'm not going to draw the bear. All right. This is going to be the bear. It's going to be the rectangle. So, so here's the bear sliding down the tree. Now, a couple things about assumptions. When the problem says, I don't know why it's doing all this today. When the problem says a smooth tree, what's implied? What's implied there is that there's no friction. That's what that means. When it says you have a smooth or you, sometimes it'll say frictionless, but you have a bear that's kind of like doing a bear hug on a tree, like a smooth tree with no branches. It's sliding down. So what are the forces acting on a bear as it slides down? Well, once again, like all the other problems, force of gravity. The bear is bear hugging the tree. It's sliding down. And bottom line, if the, the tree is completely smooth, there's no friction and there's no branches. That is the only force. You would you can't get any frictional force if it's a smooth surface. So there's a net force. The bear will be sliding down. It'll be accelerating at 9.8. Now, if there's friction, there would be a frictional force up as the bear slides down. So that would be added in if there's friction, but there's no friction here. How about a bear climbing a vertical tree at constant velocity? So now the bear is going up the tree. How would that look different? Well starts off the same, force of gravity, that's supposed to be an arrow, force of gravity, straight down. Now the bear is going up at constant velocity. This one's a little tricky, but whenever you get a constant velocity problem, you know there has to be at least two arrows and they have to be the same size. 
when there's only two because there's a net zero acceleration. So in order for a bear to climb a tree, there has to be either friction or branches that it hangs onto. But as the bear climbs the tree, either with friction with the tree, so there either has to be friction here or limbs, as the bear hits those branches and limbs, there's a force up. This is the force, and this one's a little bit tricky. It, it, like I say, it could be friction. This could be the uh, force of the, uh, I'm just going to call it the force of the tree. I'll call it tree branches. So that's a little tricky right now. That'll be more explained in the homework. But that has to be the same size. There has to be an up force, and that that results in either friction or the bear being able to to uh, to grab onto a branch, and as the bear grabs onto the branch, the the, uh, the branch in a sense exerts a force on him upward. But to go at accelerated rate, it has to be a bigger force than gravity. But if it's equal to the force of gravity, it'll go up at a constant velocity. We'll come back to that one. It's kind of a tough one, but they have to be equal. A constant velocity, the forces have to be equal. That's one of the main things to learn from that one. Here we have a car accelerating forward on a flat road. Once again, I'm just going to draw the car as a rectangle. Here's the middle of the car. All right, so the car has a force of gravity. Now, that you know, you could say it acts, uh, well, on all parts of the car once again, but we just draw one force of gravity for anything. You put the force of gravity at its center. And then there's the force of the road holding the car up, and that's at, like, all four tires. But once again, we don't draw four forces. You could draw four small forces holding up. Each one may be holding one-fourth of the car, but the net result is the force of the road is the same up as the force of the road. Once again, there's a generic term we use to call it the normal force. Those two would be equal because the car is not moving, not accelerating upward or downward, not even moving upward or downward. It's moving forward. Now, the car is accelerating forward. Because of the way the tires interact with the road, there is a force of propulsion Okay, you can call it something else. Technically, you'll learn later on in Newton's third law, it's the force of the road. That's kind of bizarre right now. But there's a forward propulsion. If you, if you said it's the force of the engine, I would take that right now. Even though it's technically not correct, I would take that. Even on a test, I'll probably take that. The force of the engine trying to make the car, uh, or motor, trying to make the car go forward. But if it's, oh, the car is accelerating. But there is friction. With a the car, there's friction within the tires, the wheels, the bearings, air friction. So generically, we say... The friction always works against you, but this car is accelerating forward. So if I draw the force of friction, I have to draw it shorter, smaller than the force of propulsion. So that's the force of friction. So there's a net force forward here to the right. It didn't tell me which direction, but it's, there's got to be one force bigger than another for it to accelerate. How about an airplane? An airplane. Once again, this is my airplane. Right? And you could just draw a dot. I've said that several times now. Don't even need the square or the rectangle. All right, so the airplane uh, is at constant horizontal velocity. Let's say it's going to the right. Okay, well, gravity is trying to pull the car, the airplane out of the, out of the sky. Force of gravity tries to pull it down. All right, so what's up? Because there's no road. There's no road. There's nothing seemingly under it. Well, there's what we call the force of lift. Force of lift, that, and it's because of the way the air goes over the, the wings and Bernoulli's principle, which you don't, know any, don't need to know anything about right now, but if you said anything about force up, even if you said force up or force of air or whatever, but I have force lift forced, upward force. But those two forces have to be equal, once again, because the airplane's not going up or down not accelerating up or down, so it'll have to be equal. Now, once again, for the if the, if the airplane is going to the right, all right, and there is we're, we're, there is implied friction here. This is the force for airplanes. This is really called usually called the force of thrust because of the way it's usually jet engines uh, basically are um, spewing out gas out the back. So there's a forward force because of the thrust of the engines. Usually there's like four four big jet engines on a commercial airline. I guess, yeah, probably four. Uh, but it also says there's friction here, and, and that's trying to slow it down. And that's called, the, well, I'm going to call it the force of 
air force of air friction. I'm just gonna call it force of air. You can call it force of air, force of air resistance. But in this case, try to draw them the same size because this one's got constant velocity. The constant velocity problems are the, are the easy ones because everything equalizes. The up and down force is equal, the, the left and right force is equal. But there's a, a kind of a quick review, or not review, but practice of free body force diagrams. They're very important to draw as we now apply Newton's second law. So I have, uh, I think, four examples here. Okay, so let's now apply F net equals MA. So we have a ball falling straight down, ball falling straight down. So now we're going to do the actual calculations. So I'm going to give myself some room. So here's the ball, and it's falling straight down because you have a force of gravity. Now it tells you in this case what the force of gravity is. Okay. Well, it tells you what the mass of the ball is. The mass is 1.8 kilograms. So I'm actually going to count. I'm going to calculate that because if you go back a unit or two, I can calculate the weight. I think it's just one unit. The weight of the ball, W equals mg. The weight of this ball, which is the force of gravity, is the mass of the ball, 1.8, make sure it's kilograms, times 9.8. If you do this with two sig figs here, that actually comes out to be 18 newtons. So the weight of this ball is 18 newtons. I'm just going to label that, 18 newtons. You could have said force of gravity, but I actually figured out the numerical value and put it in the diagram. Or you could just label the diagram F force of gravity, because weight is the force of gravity. It's 18 newtons straight down. Now it says, if the ball is falling straight down, air resistance, it says here, well, air resistance is going to be up. Air resistance always opposes your motion. It's 11 newtons. It's going to be up. I'm purposely drawing that shorter. So we can see in this problem, I hope, well, if the ball is falling down, those are the only two forces. It's falling down, air resistance is up. Those two are the forces. But now I'm just going to do F net equals MA. F net equals MA. Let me switch it up here. F net equals MA. I'll write it all out, but it's pretty straightforward. We can already see that F net is 9, but it's going to be 18. And my rule is this, when you get confused. If they're opposed to each other, I always take the big one minus the small one. In other words, 18 is down, 11 is up. Take the big one, which is 18 minus 11, equals the mass 1.8 times A. And you do the math here, you're going to get 9 equals 1.8a. I'm on a space here, but you could write that down. You don't have to write that down. But if you write that down, it's going to be 9 equals 1.8a. And you're going to get a, the acceleration equals 5 meters per second squared. I would let you put 5.0. Technically, it's going to be 1 sig fig, because when you take 18 minus 11, you get 9, which is a 1 sig fig number but I would allow you to put 5.0 meters per second squared here for the answer. So that's the acceleration, and the direction is down. I would even let you put that, you don't need to say down, that's in the diagram, but down, the acceleration is down. All right, how about a ball, number two? You have a ball that was thrown and it has been released. So once again, it's very important. You're not in the process of throwing this ball. The ball has been thrown, but now it's moving up. And we've already calculated this. In other words, the force of gravity, it's the same ball. We just did it in the previous problem. It's the same ball. The force of gravity is still 18 newtons. I don't need to recalculate that. But if it was, this was a standalone problem, show the calculations. Show me that you calculated that, that weight of that ball. Here's the weird thing here. Watch carefully. Here's where the physics is. If a ball is going up, all right, and there's air resistance, that means the air resistance force, and this gets a little tricky here, is down because the ball is moving up air resistance opposes you so there's 11 newtons let's draw that a little shorter so check this out that's down all right the air resistance force is opposite the motion so now we have all right f net equals ma f net once again what causes acceleration a net force not force net force well here the net force, they're both in the same direction, so these are vectors. You add 18 plus 11. That will be the net force equals the mass 1.8 times A. So you're going to get 18 plus 11 is 29, which is truly two sig figs, divided by 1.8. If you do the math there, you get A equals 16 meters per second squared. So that's also down. I, you wouldn't need to say that in these problems. But the acceleration is always in the direction of the net force. And then there's two forces down. The net force is down. The 
the, uh, the acceleration is down. So that's applying Newton's second law. Uh, acceleration is caused by net force. How about this one? A hockey puck. A player does a slap shot to a hockey puck. So from a side view, this one's pretty easy in the sense that the diagram, I mean, from the side view, even though the hockey puck is round from a top view, from the side view, it looks like a rectangle. The nice thing about these is you can draw them simply. You, once again, you can just make this a dot, but there's my hockey puck from the side view. All right. So it says a uh, hockey player applies a force of 120 newtons. Uh, okay. Well, I have the force of gravity, which I actually don't know what this hockey puck weighs. I don't even know the mass. We're looking for the mass. So I can put the label on there, but I don't know what that number is. Excuse me, yet. But I also know the force of the ice is up. All right. The, the force of the ice surface is up, and that's equal. Those two are equal. Whatever they are, they're equal because the hockey puck's not moving or accelerating up and down. But let's say somebody gives a slap shot to the right on this hockey puck. In other words, they apply a force this way. Force of stick. Force of shot. Force of hockey player. Whatever you want to call it. It's really the stick. The, the hockey stick hitting the puck. Not the player itself. But I would let you say force of hockey player. But force of the stick. Now it says in this case, there's no frictional forces. And it says to uh, assume uniform acceleration. Well, in all the problems, we're going to assume uniform acceleration. But this one explicitly says that, just to kind of remind me to tell you that. These problems are all assuming uniform acceleration, not some kind of varying acceleration. In this case, there's no other, there's no frictional force. There's very little friction with a hockey puck on ice, supposedly. There might be a little bit. So there might be some friction to the left, but we're ignoring it here. It tells us in the problem to ignore it. It says assuming no frictional forces, uniform acceleration. Calculate the mass of the puck. Well, this one, all right, F net equals MA. Net force causes acceleration. Well, here, oh, and I already know, it tells me in the problem that the force of the stick is 120 newtons. I didn't label that in the diagram. That's 120, make sure it's newtons. So I could have put that, instead of force of stick, I could have put 120 newtons. That's what that number is. A lot of times that's what I like to do is just put the number on the diagram and not the label. Either way is fine. Uh, the mass I'm looking for, the acceleration, well that's a large acceleration. 730, it's correct units, make sure, double check that. But if you do the math here, it comes out to be 0 0.16 kilograms, two sig figs, like 160 grams. And I purposely looked this up and that actually is, I think, accurate for a hockey puck. It has about 160 grams of mass. 0.160 kilograms. But that's quite a shot there. It's not even a really, that's a pretty high speed slap shot, but I think that they're capable of more um, high speed, uh, more higher acceleration than that. That's a lot of, it's a lot of force for that small puck. Okay, a car. All right, we did a car problem a little earlier. Now actually, okay. Once again, I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. At least attempt that. Car. You can draw something with wheels and everything else. I'm drawing a little big here. So we have the car. It says a 1,300 kilogram car. We have the force of gravity. So I, I, a lot of times I'll just do the calculation real fast because it's a 1,300 kilogram car. I take, take W equals mg. So the weight of this car is 1,300 times 9.8. Uh, if you do the math there, that's... Uh, Okay, doesn't really matter. It actually, is, it's around, it's around, it's around 13,000. It's around 13,000 newtons. It actually doesn't matter here because that's not actually one of the numbers we need. So I did extra work here. That's okay. 1600, 1300 newtons if you do, if you round out the two sig figs. Because if you round, if you multiply by 10, 9.8 is close to 10. That's real close, but it won't matter here. The road is also going to be, the force of the road is also going to be about 13,000 newtons. Immaterial here because there's no acceleration that way. In this case, it says the, the car is accelerating forward. We're going to call forward to the right because of the way the engine through the transmission turns the wheels. The wheels exert forces on the road and so forth. Um, but it's accelerating this way, forward. Let's call that forward. And it says that the forward force is 6,400 newtons. So we have a for forward force of 6,400 newtons. 
because the, you're hitting the gas pedal. It says, what is the force of air resistance? It's accelerating to the right. If you're accelerating to the right, then your force of air resistance to the left. Force of air. Air resistance. Now, right now, the, since the car is accelerating to the right, I know that my propelling force is bigger than the force of air. Air force. Okay. Uh, if you take your gas, your foot off the gas, then your 6,400 newtons basically goes to zero and the force of air slows you down. Then the force of air would be the, the net force if there was no forward propelling force of 6,400. But this is, this car is accelerating to the right. It tells us that in the problem. So it's just F net equals MA. And once again, uh, what you want to do is take, if, if you know one force is bigger than the other, and I know the 6,400 is the bigger force because it's accelerating to the right. So I take the big force, 6,400, minus force of air. So that's how you get the net force of two forces when they're lined up like that. It's nice we don't have to do vector components yet. Those may come along here. But this one's a 1,300 kilogram car. And the acceleration is 3.7. So we're, we have 6,400 newtons minus the force of the air, air friction, resistance, air resistance, equals, that comes out to be about 2,200. So if you move things around here, force of air, all right, uh, if you, basically if you move it around, do all the algebra there, what I like to do is move the force of air to the right, which would make it positive, and then subtract the 2,200 from both sides, you get 40, you get 4,200 if you do the math here. 4,200 newtons. That's the force of air, and it's opposing your motion, so I have that in the diagram. So there we go, applying Newton's second law. Most importantly, what causes acceleration? Net force. Net force. Net force causes acceleration, not force. You need to be very specific about that. Always look for the net force. If there's only one force, yeah, that is the net force. But when there's more than one force, there's two. And so we'll start doing problems where there's three, four, five forces that you've got to combine that are all like left and right. So we'll do more of those. But this is good uh, practice, good introduction. Net force causes acceleration. F net equals MA. Now, get ready for Newton's third law. Probably the easiest one in, in um, our minds to start with. But it's the third one, so that's why we do it in those orders. And you've heard of it before. For every action, okay, if you don't know the answer to the second part of that law, you'll just wait for me to do the notes in section unit 4.3.